you, Kevin, for that introduction. My name is Paul Huebner, and as Kevin said, I'm the middle school director here at Black Rock Church, and it's great to be here with you tonight. How many of you guys frequently listen to podcasts? I'm a big podcast fan because I love to be able to do something else while I'm listening to a podcast. And one podcast in particular has caught my attention recently. And it's about two people, Marshall Applewhite and Bonnie Nettles, better known together as the UFO 2. And Applewhite was a music teacher in Houston and Nettles was a nurse until they met each other and they felt some sort of special connection, especially over spiritual matters. And eventually, the two of them decided that they were the two witnesses from Revelation 11, and they decided to found their own cult, as one does. The cult was known as Heaven's Gate. They believed that God was an alien and that they were living in the end times. They created fake names for everyone in their cult, and everyone was forced to wear baggy clothing and have a short haircut so their alien vessels could look the same as each other. Their human bodies needed to undergo an alien transformation so they could be transported into outer space on a UFO. But unfortunately for them, Nettles ended up passing away. So Applewhite had to take it up a notch. And instead of the aliens coming down, he said, the way that we have to pass into our alien transformation is through death. And unfortunately, the Hale-Bopp comet was passing by the Earth in March of 1997, and he sees that as the opportunity to say, the end is here. So Applewhite and 38 of his members donned black track suits and sneakers. They ate applesauce laced with barbiturates, and they drank vodka to wash it down. And they had 575 in their pockets, as in interplanetary toll, as they freed their souls to ascend to the UFO that awaited them. It was the largest mass suicide on American soil. Now, you've heard the gist of what it means to be a member of Heaven's Gate. You understand their mission, you know what they're about. But I'm pretty sure you aren't convinced that you need to eat the special applesauce so that you can become the next supreme alien being. You both understand the, the core tenets of what the cult represents, but your reactions are different. While they react with utter obedience for the sake of something that is fake, you correctly reject it with absolute abhorrence. Why is that? How can we, who are exposed to the same knowledge as them, have such a different response? I think it boils down to belief. The Gospel of Mark describes a scenario that illustrates this question. How can different people have such different opinions on the same knowledge? Today we're gonna to be in Mark 12, one through two, and a little bit of context here. So the day before this showdown happens, Jesus purifies the temple courts. And he's not just doing a white glove check, Jesus is throwing tables over. He's driving out people from the temple. The account of John says that he created a whip and he drove people out with a whip. But today he has something even more intense planned. Today is going to be the ultimate showdown. He's already, the crowds are standing there, they're watching. They're, they're saying, man, this is the moment. We're gonna, we're gonna see this showdown. Who's gonna win? Is it gonna be Jesus or is it going to be this crowd of a religious elite that are around him? A lot's at stake here and both parties know it. So in chapter 11 of Mark, Jesus faces off against the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders who confront him about his authority. After that parable, Jesus gets challenged by the Pharisees and the Herodians who say, what do you do about the imperial tax? And Jesus says, give to Caesar what's Caesar's, give to God what's God's. After that, Jesus squares up against the Sadducees who are followed by one of the teachers of the law. The theme of this section is marked is that Jesus is confronting the Jerusalem establishment. The parable lands a powerful blow to the pride of the religious elite at the time. And I think in the midst of these encounters, Jesus tells a parable to illustrate a point. It's known as a parable of the tenants. Let's dig into it in Mark 12, verse one. Jesus began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He built a wall around it. He dug a pit for the wine press and he built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a ser servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. So at the beginning of this, it says that Jesus is speaking to them. That's referring to 
the audience in Mark 11, who are the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. These are the three constituent parts of the Sanhedrin at the time. That was the pinnacle of the religious elite during Jesus' time. Jesus is speaking this parable to them. And at first glance, it seems like Jesus might be making the story up on the fly. But I think that there's some context to the story, that Jesus is pulling it from a different source. It's kind of like, I think it's kind of like a Marvel movie. How many of you guys have ever seen a Marvel movie? Most of us, right? So if you know anything about Marvel movies, you know that a Marvel movie is informed by the comic. So there's a comic that came out first, and it produces the movie. But there's not necessarily a one-to-one correlation between a comic series and the movie itself. Oftentimes, the movie producers will pull multiple comic series together to make one movie. For example, Infinity War is a combination of the series Infinity and Infinity Gauntlet. Infinity is the scene that happens in Wakanda, whereas Infinity Gauntlet introduces the stones. Each are an aspect that feeds into the narrative of the whole movie. So what Jesus is doing here is Jesus is using the Old Testament in that way. Jesus is saying the Old Testament is going to inform what I'm going to talk about here in the New Testament. The, old, the themes from the Old Testament are going to impact the plot line of his parable. And what Jesus is pulling from is Isaiah. So Jesus pulls from Isaiah 5, 1 through 7. Isaiah 5, 1 through 7 is the song of the vineyard. The song of the vineyard is a parable told in Isaiah. And Jesus, I think, chooses it for a reason. Let's read verses 1 through 3 of Isaiah 5 to look at the Old Testament context Jesus is bringing to the table. It says, let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones, planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. So we see very similar themes, I think, between Isaiah and Mark. So there's a vineyard, there's a pit for the wine press, there's a watchtower. Jesus uses these stock images from the Old Testament to evoke in the minds of his audience the story from Isaiah. Now, when Kevin taught here a while ago, he talked about how if you wanted to be a rabbi, you had to go through extremely strict training to get to that point. And you had essentially memorize all the Old Testament to get there. So when Jesus tells this story, this parable, these religious elite are thinking, wait, he's quoting from Isaiah 5. But wait, he's trying to tell his own story. What's, what's going on here? But why bring Isaiah to mind? Why not just create a fresh story? Why, why does Jesus have to pull from Isaiah? Well, I think the Isaiah context is very important here. First of all, the most agriculturally intense activity you could do in the ancient times was to build a vineyard. Because from the time of planting to the time of harvest was usually three to four years. So you would wait a long time to be able to reap the fruit of your harvest. And actually, there's a law in Deuteronomy that says if you plant a vineyard, you're exempt from war because it would be unthinkable for you to go to war and die and not enjoy the fruits of your labor. And God is meticulous in how he plants his vineyard in Isaiah. He does a number of things like clearing out the space, digging out a wine vat. God chooses the sorek in Hebrew vine instead of the typical gefen. This is like top shelf wine that's going to be produced, not a like fruit scotto like some people like to drink. Jesus, God builds a watchtower instead of a usual hut. And in the Iron Age that Isaiah writes in, field towers are very rare. God is meticulously looking out for his vineyard. He wants to watch over it. And God plants the good grapes. God plants the anovim. And we're talking like cotton candy grapes. How many of you guys have had cotton candy grapes before? I swear they taste exactly like cotton candy. And you definitely pay for it because they're so expensive. But they're delicious. You, you're like, man, I can't believe I'm eating fruit right now. But he plants Anuvim, the good grapes, and he yields Besuim, which are bitter grapes, small grapes. Have you ever been eating that bunch of grapes and you're like, man, I'm so hungry. There's that little grape there. I think I'm going to eat it. And then you eat it, and it's so sour and so tart. It's like it ruins the rest of anything you eat for the next few minutes. God is expecting one thing. He's expecting a good harvest, and he reaps a bad harvest. He demands fruitfulness, but he doesn't receive it. 
And Isaiah 5, 7 offers the key to this parable. So if I, I'll sum it up. It says that the Lord is the owner in this parable in Isaiah. The vineyard of, is the house of Israel. The grapes are the men of Judah. And the fruits he wants are justice and righteousness. But what he gets are the wild grapes of ju- bloodshed and an outcry. By drawing from this source, Jesus is expressing explicitly a theme of God's disappointment with his people. Why does Jesus choose to use a parable, though? I think John T. Willis gives a great explanation for why you'd want to use a parable. He says, a parable is presented in such a way as to make hearers participants in the event being portrayed and empathizers with a certain character or characters in the plot and to force them to naturally pass judgment on themselves. Now, that's kind of wordy. It's kind of hard to understand. Let's break it down. A parable is a great way to disarm your audience. So this is the prophet Nathan's tact when he approaches David about Bathsheba. Instead of saying, David, you sinned, you're a wicked, wretched man, repent, Nathan comes up to David and he tells a parable. He tells a story about sheep. And being a shepherd, that's something that David can relate to. And David, hearing the story, says, that man in the story needs to be punished. And and then Nathan says, you are the man. David passes judgment on himself. And that is something that... David can realize it and the weight of the parable sinks in because it's a realization that he wasn't told by somebody else. It's something he's realized for himself. And that's exactly what Jesus is trying to do. He's in the middle of a showdown with the religious authorities of his day. And he's hoping maybe they'll draw their own conclusion without him having to even explicitly say it. I think the first key difference in, between Jesus' story and Isaiah's story is the only factors at play in the Isaiah story are the owner, who we've said is God, the vineyard, which says Israel, and the fruits, which are justice and righteousness, and then the wild grapes, which are an outcry and bloodshed. Jesus introduces us to some new characters. And I think in order to understand what a parable means, you need to understand what the objects and what the people that are introduced in the parable represent. So Jesus introduces a servant, followed by several servants. He introduces the tenants, he introduces the son, and he introduces the new tenants. So for us today, we have to think, being informed by this Isaiah context, how do we figure out the four people that are represented in Jesus' parable? So let's keep reading and let's break down what each of those four people represent. Let's go to verse 3. It says, And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. They're talking about the servant. And again, he sent to them another servant. And they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so many others, some they beat and some they killed. So in a typical owner-tenant relationship, you would have an agreed-upon portion of the crop that you'd have to yield over to the landlord. So these tenants are entrusted with the responsibility of getting fruit, and then paying for the privilege of being able to work the land back to the owner. The owner sends a servant and to collect that fruit that he, he deserves. But the tenants send the servant away. They send the servants away empty-handed. Not only that, but they beat the servants that are sent to kill them. And it says that there are many servants who have been sent seeking to find fruit in the vineyard, justice and righteousness among the people of Israel. Who does God send to historically find justice and righteousness among the people of Israel? Well, it's the prophets. God has sent many prophets to be able to say, this is my word. I want you to turn back to justice and righteousness. And whoever these tenants are would reject the messengers, the prophets that God had sent. They aren't just leaving God on red. They're blocking his contact. They want nothing to do with God. So let's keep reading. So, verse 6. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him. The inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. This is the climax of the story. By refusing to pay the owner of the vineyard, they're attempting to usurp control of the vineyard from the owner. They're challenging him to enforce the payment if he can. The owner has an idea. 
The sentence in Greek conveys that this isn't just another attempt. This is his last resort. This is his last shot to be able to reach the tenants. And he uses his most precious option, his beloved son. I think that word beloved is very important and is very meticulously chosen by Jesus. So in Jesus' ministry, you have Jesus' baptism where there's a voice from heaven that says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And then later on, just before this happened, there's the transfiguration. And during the transfiguration, God shows up and God says, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. There's no mistaking who the son in this parable is. It's Jesus, the beloved son, the son with whom God is well pleased. The son is Jesus. The tenants see Jesus who represents the authority of God and they want to kill him to usurp the inheritance that he deserves. The tenants are reaping the bitter grapes of Isaiah 5. They're carrying out bloodshed and causing an outcry. And right after this parable, Jesus drives this point home when he is asked about paying taxes to Caesars. He says, render to Caesar what's Caesar's and render to God what's God's. Here's the thing, is that the tenants haven't given the owner the fruit of the vineyard that he deserves. The tenants have not yielded the righteousness and justice God requires from them and the people of Israel. Instead, they've tried to usurp the vineyard for themselves and for their own selfish gain. I think that the punch of the parable comes in identifying who the last character represents, the tenants. So let's read again in verse 9. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. Here's another parallel with Isaiah 5. So in Isaiah 5, 3 through 4, the question is posed to the listener. And now, o inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. Jesus is also breaking the fourth wall, and he's asking his audience, what will the owner of the vineyard do? What will God do in response to the tenants killing his beloved son? God will come, the tenants will be destroyed, and the vineyard will be given away to others. Who are these tenants? Well, they give themselves away in Mark's account. It says, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. Bro, he better not be talking about us. He better not. The members of the Sanhedrin are called out, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. The word destroy is intentional here. God's not going to merely judge them. He's not going to kill them. He's going to utterly and permanently destroy them by bringing about not just their own end, but the end of their reign and all that they stand for. The old regime is overthrown. This is a fitting punishment. In Mark 3, 6, right after Jesus heals on the Sabbath, the Pharisees and Herodians plot to destroy Jesus. In Mark eleven eighteen, 18, right after Jesus cleanses the temple, the chief priests and the teachers of the law seek a way to destroy Jesus. They're reaping what's in their hearts. The destruction they intend for the Son of God will be visited upon themselves. They desire to usurp the nation of Israel for their own corrupt and selfish purposes, but God will not hand it over. In the scripture, God pulls a Marvel plot line here for the second time, and Jesus quotes Psalm 118, 22 through 23. It tells the second half of the story. The parable didn't mention the son being vindicated, but this psalm does. The son is not just killed and avenged. The son's future is reversed. Even though the stone was rejected, now it's become the capstone. It's the most integral part of the whole structure. And in rabbinic literature, scribes and scholars are sometimes referred to as builders, so maybe this is even a secondary jab that Jesus is having at the religious authorities of the day. This results in bringing glory to God and marveling from the people, as the psalm says. The kingdom of God demands a reversal of human values and expectations. Jesus the Messiah shatters expectations of the people. He's both the son of David, the Messiah that rules and reigns, but also the son of the vineyard who's killed. There's a second consequence to the killing of the son. It's not just the current establishment's destruction, it's the vineyard being given over to others. The people of God will be under new leadership. Bye. Who's this new leadership? Well, it's the management of the vineyard being transferred from the religious authorities over to the disciples. 
The people of God will still be there, but the management will be displaced. The church is a renewed Israel, and it will be spearheaded by the disciples. Now, there's a lot to unpack in this account. I think Jesus reaches a crucial point in his showdown with the religious authorities of the day. Here's the part that gets me, though. In verse 12, it says, they perceived he had told the parable against them. The religious authorities know the point that Jesus is making. Jesus is predicting they will kill him. This is their chance to repent. This is their chance to surrender their plans and submit to the authority of God. They know that what Jesus is about at this point. In this parable, the, the tenants recognize the son before killing him. The Sanhedrin recognize who Jesus is before they kill him. The parable actually becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And the interesting part is these teachers have just as much, if not more, of an understanding about who Jesus is than the crowds and the disciples around them. They've studied the Old Testament text extensively, yet they reject Jesus. It's not due to a lack of knowledge or information, it's due to something else. I think that we are faced with the same proposition. Many of you at Sanctuary know this Jesus. You've been in church for quite a few years, if not the majority of your lives. You've heard the stories of the virgin birth, You know the parable of the prodigal son by heart. You know the Easter story of Jesus dying and being resurrected from the dead. But does that knowledge mean anything to you? It certainly didn't to the Sanhedrin. I told you about Heaven's Gate at the beginning of the sermon, and you understood some of its core premises. The cult meant so much to its constituents that they were willing to voluntarily die for it. Those cultish beliefs don't mean anything to you, though, despite your knowledge of them. Knowledge cannot be the key aspect in determining belief. It must be a different factor. Knowledge cannot be the key aspect in determining belief. It must be a different factor. Let me illustrate this with an example from gym culture. So I think that there's an evolution of the gym bro. So when you first go to the gym, You're hanging out with your buddies, you're having a good time, you're joking around, you're flexing in the mirror, like checking yourself out, like, oh, I'm I'm hot stuff. And eventually you reach a point of maturity where you're like, you know what, I'm going to enter phase two. I'm going to become, I'm going to do this for the right reasons. I want to be fit. I want to maybe impress that significant other that I know, that that beautiful person. I want to be healthy. I want to live a long, good life. And you start working out, you start setting goals, you start seeing progress. But inevitably, phase three of the gym bro hits. And you start looking around and looking, checking people out. Specifically, the other bros that are bigger than you, that are more jacked than you. And you start looking at them and you're like, man, that guy is huge. Like, he's jacked out of his mind. This guy's a monster. Like, I can never be as big as this dude. And you start comparing yourself to that guy and start saying, like, man, I wish I could be like that. And what it does is it slowly drives you to the point where you have an inner despair and you start working out harder and harder and harder, but you never, you're never going to reach that goal of being that monstrous human being that is this guy at the gym. So this realization started hitting me in middle school. When I was in middle school, I had, there was a guy in high school that was jacked out of his mind. And I was like, if I could be half as strong as this dude, I'd be in a good place. If you told middle school Paul this dude could lift a car with one hand, I would have believed you. And this guy was a, he said he was going into the Marines. Of course he was. It just made sense. And we ended up going our separate ways. He went to college. I went to college a while later. And ended up coming back to Connecticut. And I found a gym to go to. And I started going to the gym. And I was doing the bro thing of like looking around the gym, checking out the competition, and I see someone. I'm like, man, that guy looks so familiar. Wait, is that that dude I knew from way back then? And I look at him, and I'm like, no, it can't be. Because he no longer has that peak physical physique. He's, He's definitely put on a few pounds. He's not looking as good as he used to. But I'm looking at him, I'm like, He's got the right face. He's got the right like, haircut. We're in my hometown, which is where we both grew up. Like, What are the odds? But I couldn't bring myself to go up to him. I couldn't bring myself to say, 
hey, how's it going? Because I just couldn't, I had all the knowledge that I needed to be able to discern it was him, but I couldn't bring myself to say, hey. So I did what every rational person does and went on social media and stalked him and realized, oh, this is that guy. And I was like, you know what? Even though I had all the information I needed to be able to tell me that this was my friend that I knew from back in middle school, I just didn't believe it. There was something in my mind that wouldn't let me believe that this was the same person. And I found out after being like so judgmental that this dude had an injury and that's why he had put on some pounds. And I was like, wow, I feel like a terrible person. But there was something in my mind that couldn't believe it was him, even though I knew all the information I had to be able to get there. There is a difference between knowledge and belief. I think it's easy for us to know things. Our culture celebrates knowledge. We have massive celebrations for those graduating high school. Stadiums are filled for college graduations. If you have your PhD, our society trusts your judgment on anything. Anything. It doesn't matter what you got your PhD in. Oh, you're a doctor? You know everything in life. We have a saying that says knowledge is power, right? The kingdom of God is an upside-down kingdom, though. It's a kingdom where the stone that the builders have rejected has become the cornerstone. The disciples and the religious system of the day have rejected them. They've now become the new tenants. The old establishment is gone and the new is here. Which set of tenants will you be a part of? Knowledge doesn't qualify you. Here's the proof. In John 2.12 it says, This the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. The disciples believed him. The first sign that Jesus performs and they believe him. Not the 28th religious seminar, not the 5,000th question answered, not the reading of all the religious literature out there in the world so you could have your questions answered, not until the moment feels just right or God feels close, they sense the power of God on display and they respond with belief. I had a student once that I was discipling. We'll call him Bill. And he was talking with me about how he really wanted God to show up in his life so he could know that God was real. Having a relationship with him, I brought up some scenarios from his life. How Bill's family was overcoming addiction at impossible odds. How Bill said that he felt like he was walking away from every youth group, feeling like the message was spoken directly to him. How Bill's grandfather had been driving by the church when we were renovating it, and Bill's grandfather felt the need to go into the church. They asked him who he was, and then they said, you know, we were just praying that we could have a craftsman come into our church to restore it. And he's like, I'm a craftsman, I can do that. And he was the reason why they were able to carry out the million dollar renovation project at that church. And because of that, Bill ended up attending our student ministry. I told Bill that God was revealing himself to him. What are the odds? What are the odds that these things happen? I told Bill I could definitely see the hand of God on his life. And Bill agreed, and he decided to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that day. Bill had the pieces, but he didn't necessarily have the right disposition, the right heart posture. Once he had the right disposition, he could believe. What's your heart's disposition? Have you become so saturated in Christianity that you've mistaken it for belief? You just sang worship songs did you believe them? You are alive in me. You are all my heart beats for. Thank you for breaking the bread of my body, for spilling the wine of your blood. Do you believe those things to be potential facts? Or do you have a disposition and a belief that lets you celebrate them, that lets you believe them? Perhaps you need to make a shift in your heart. You can't do this on your own, though. Jesus has an encounter with a man who's oppressed by a demon. The disciples fail to cast it out. The bewildered father comes to Jesus and asks him if he's able to do anything. Jesus responds, if you can, all things are possible for him who believes. The response of the man, he cries out and says, I believe, help my unbelief. If I could have the band come on up as I finish up. He says, help my unbelief. I think that there's seasons in our life that our belief falters during. Times when we don't have the answers we want. That's okay, it's great to have questions. Answers to questions actually help build our faith. But don't be deceived. Finding answers and acquiring knowledge is not the same as belief. If that was the case, 
then the religious elite would have been the first to sign up as Jesus' disciples. We need to adjust our heart posture so it allows for belief. While knowledge is important, it's powerless without the right disposition, without the right heart posture. At the beginning of the sermon, I gave you knowledge about that cult, but it didn't garner belief. I find that it's incredible that those cult members so strongly held their belief in something that is blatantly false, but when we're faced with the absolute truth of the gospel, we can't find ourselves in a place where hearts can commit just a little bit. We have the truth. We have Jesus Christ, the Son of God who died on behalf of our sins and rose victoriously from the grave. Our God is reaching out to us. He wants us to have more than just knowledge of him. He asks for our belief. What will it take for you to shift your heart posture to let belief in? What will it take for your heart's posture to let belief in? Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you that you're a God that does new things. That you replace the old tenants with the new. I thank you that your kingdom is not one that's built on knowledge, but it's built on belief. And God, I thank you that you love each and every one of us here. I thank you that you are reaching out to each and every one of us. I pray that we wouldn't grow stagnant in our faith, that we wouldn't mistake the knowledge of having grown up and being saturated in Christian culture with belief, but that we would truly have our hearts' dispositions changed, that our hearts would be open to you and who you are, that we wouldn't just have a hunger for knowing you, but we'd have a hunger for believing that what you said is true. We have a hunger for believing in the Lord Jesus Christ so that we might be saved. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.